welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar. And we're gonna, we are going to be talking about wildlife damage management. Um, going to focus on vegetable production. A lot of the, those same principles in dealing with wildlife uh, pests, as we are defining them now, um, are principles that you can use in other production areas as well. So. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just like any pest, if we've identified this animal now as a pest, just as we would any other organism, whether it's an insect or a plant, um, then we need to try to figure out what is causing the problem. And so we're looking at signs of that animal for the, of, uh, of the damage. Oftentimes we don't see that animal, so we're looking at uh, cuttings. You know, we really have to find out, you know, what what animal is causing the problem. And then depending on whether that it's a short period of time we're experiencing damage or year round might um, lead us to some decision making about how much money we're willing to spend on control of that particular animal. Um, we also then have to be very careful uh, in our selection of that practice that we're not going to have another, have any negative impact on other wildlife species in particular, um, or plant material uh, in the environment, just as we would with any other uh, pest management program. So these are the control options we have available for the most part uh, with animals that we're having going to have problems with in Illinois. Um, we're going to talk about p ways to reduce the population, that's one strategy modifying the habitat, trying to keep them, keep the animal from getting to our crop, excluding that animal. Um, I'm going to talk about fencing, those types of things, repellents, and frightening devices. And uh, one of the key things I want you to remember, just like any pest we are trying to control, we're going to want to use an integrated pest management approach where not any one of those five principles or practices is going to be alone probably going to be totally effective. So we're going to use multiple strategies and hopefully reduce the damage, probably may not be able to eliminate it, um, and we'll talk about those kind of things as we go this afternoon. I wanted to start with population reduction and just to clarify for everyone that uh, just because that animal is on your property, in your in your crop field, um, eating green beans, sweet corn, what have you, um, you do not unfortunately have the right to do whatever you want to to that particular animal. In other words, uh, especially if you're looking at lethal control, um, so trapping or shooting that animal, um, unless you have one or two things. Um, a, if it's during the non-hunting season, that animal has a hunting season in Illinois. Um, if it's during outside that normal season, then you need a wildlife nuisance damage permit. Uh, those are free uh, and they're obtained from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, they are all animal, all, all mammals are protected by the Illinois State Wildlife Code. Birds are also offered that protection, uh, and then any migratory bird is also offered federal protection under the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So it's a really important concept uh, that so you don't get yourself into trouble. I know a lot of times it can be extremely aggravating, um, and uh, in addition, you're experiencing some economic loss. Um, but I encourage you to go through, get get a permit if it's during the non-hunting season. If it's an animal, it's a game species in Illinois, and we have a hunting season, uh, then uh, getting you can harvest that animal if you follow the hunting rules and regulations we have in Illinois, which would include having a valid Illinois hunting license, and then following the uh, game, the, the uh, uh, bag limits, etc., and for that particular species. Some options in terms of population reduction. Uh, one is seasonal hunting. So, for example, you have problems with uh, rabbits or deer. So, we're going to talk about that as a really important concept or a part of an integrated approach. If you're not allowing seasonal hunting of deer, 
then you need to look at inviting some folks in there to hunt. Trapping is another option uh, for raccoons, as an example. If you had some trapping, had some raccoon problems uh, in your sweet corn, then inviting a, a recreational trapper to your property to to remove some of those animals during the trapping season. If you're trapping an animal and moving it, then you need a wildlife nuisance damage permit. Even though you don't intend to to destroy that animal, you still need a permit because that animal is in your um, in your possession when you're transporting it from one place to another. Oh, yeah. And then toxicants. Most animals, uh, we don't have toxicants as a population reduction option unless we're talking about rodents. So we'll talk about rodenticides <clears throat> when we get to talking about voles. Our goal with population reduction is looking at trying to reduce the entire population of animals <clears throat> on our property in the surrounding area to a point not eliminating them but reducing that population so that other practices that we utilize um, can be more effective. Habitat modification. Then habitat modification is just reducing that uh, available habitat instead of increasing the quality of that increasing the quality of the habitat for that particular animal, we're going to use opposite goals for wildlife management. And that's we're, our goal is to decrease the amount of food, water, and shelter on the, you know, on your property. And that's just simply, we're going to talk about practices that include removing brushy areas or mowing the grass, depending on that particular species. So understanding the habitat requirements for that animal is really important if we're going to use habitat modification as a practice. Exclusion is another technique that we can apply. Fencing individual, individual plants um, or planting areas in the case of vegetable production. Uh, it's not an inexpensive option, but it is an option that uh, is, has a place in an in integrated pest, <clears throat> pest management approach. <clears throat> Repellents. Um, the main, one of the things to remember about repellents are that they are regulated as if they were a pesticide. So you need the, the label, just like any pesticide is a legal document, you must read and follow the label. Um, it must be registered for use on that particular species you plan to use it on. And uh, there are three different types or groups of repellents, taste repellents, uh, area repellents, and then if we're trying to keep birds out of a barn or a storage area from roosting, we might use a tactile type of repellent. Repellents, uh, probably the most effective repellent uh, might be at about 85%. Most are going to work 50 to 60% of the time. Um, they're a good tool to use when you're trying to eliminate a some damage during a short period of time. So <clears throat> we'll talk more about those with individual species, but you know, if the damage is occurring in a, a small window of time, then um, a repellent can have some effectiveness. The negative is that many products don't weather very well, so they may only last, as an example, we'll talk about hinder. It only lasts two to four weeks, so you're going to have to reapply that product and so it can be expensive. The other uh, limitation in terms of vegetable production is that most of these repellents can only be applied to uh, uh, ornamentals so or trees during the dormant period. Uh, fruit trees, as an example, have got to spray, use those, m many of the taste repellents um, prior to flowering. So we are limited with the repellents we can utilize for vegetable production. Frightening devices. There's a lot of frightening devices on the market. Um, some of those are, you know, like the balloon in the upper left-hand corner are visual frightening devices, um, and then sound-producing devices like the propane-fired cannon in the bottom right-hand portion of the slide. Uh, frightening devices are again going to have short windows of time when they're going to be effective. So if you have deer um, getting into sweet corn as an example, 
um, in an unfenced area. A propane cannon, and a lot of producers will use a propane cannon to keep the deer out of that uh, sweet corn patch during pollination because deer love to eat just the silks off the off the ears of corn. And so uh, propane cannon might work for a couple weeks. Uh, and then after a while, um, like all mammals, they have learned learned behavior. So they learn that that noise isn't going to hurt them and they'll ignore the sound. So that's why you've got to use a variety of strategies if you're going to increase the effectiveness of a frightening device, whether it's a visual or a sound device. Um, otherwise, they're really thought to be uh, ineffective. All right, let's talk about rabbits for a minute. Eastern cottontail rabbit is the rabbit we have throughout Illinois. The good news about rabbits is that they have a relatively short lifespan because they are near the bottom of the food chain. Um, average lifespan is about a year, but they can have multiple litters of young. They'll uh, generally in southern Illinois we might see up to six litters per year. Northern Illinois, three or four litters per year with four young per litter. So the reproductive potential is is extremely high. But look at the home range; They're, it's not very large. So we can, you know, manage rabbits um, by looking at the habitat around them. The, the rabbits prefer what wildlife biologists call edge habitat. An edge is just where one habitat type meets another. And so generally in those types of areas you see you know, a variety of grasses and broadleaf plants or forbs uh, and adjacent to density brush areas. Uh, and if you've got some shrubs that uh, are available for that rabbit, they uh, have got all their needs met because they've got some escape cover and winter cover. So those kind of areas, an edge habitat adjacent to a crop field is not a good idea. So we want to we can manage that wild, that rabbit population on our property a little bit by keeping those isolated because of a small home range in one corner of the of our farm. If you've got acreage that's uh, only 10 or 20 acres, then um, uh, then managing that population uh, through habitat modification may be, uh, may be limited, but um, still can provide uh, some techniques that we'll talk about in just a second. Exclude, excluding a rabbit requires a fence that has a mesh opening or opening in that mesh wire of one inch or less. Um, if you use anything larger than that, young rabbits can still squeeze through. Um, in the winter time, especially if you're trying to protect um, You've got uh, brambles or or uh, blueberries or some other type of woody plant and orchard. Um, then you need to pay attention to areas that might drift. So you want a fence that they're not going to go over the top like that picture in the left side of that slide. Uh, the fence needs to be tight to the ground. They recommend actually burying the fence um, six inches, taking that fence and making an L out six inches away from the fence, so an L-shaped uh, bottom of the wire, and then burying that six inches so they can't dig underneath it. Um, you can put it tight to the ground and add an electric fence wire, and that's going to help other uh, animals that uh, you may be trying to control, uh, like raccoons and groundhogs. <coughs> rabbits in terms of repellents. Um, most of the repellents that are labeled for use for rabbits have contain a product called Firam, uh, which is a fungicide. And its use is limited to ornamentals um, or woody plants uh, during the dormant season. So uh, unfortunately for vegetable production during the summertime, we're looking at uh, repellents is not part of our tool, uh, for, uh, tool bag for um, integrated pest management of rabbits. But it does provide you another option in the wintertime. Rabbits can do a lot of damage to woody plants in the during the wintertime, especially when we have some snow cover, and that's the only thing that they can uh, find to eat. Remember I initially said that rabbits need a brushy area, areas that um, we would 
they have for escape cover. So in the case of enhancing habitat for, for rabbits, actually construction of brush piles is a recommendation. Um, so removing those kind of areas, removing tall grass areas, or at least maintaining a zone of separation, a mode area between those kind of areas on your property and your crop field is a way to make um, uh, an, an area that would have rabbits be more, more vulnerable to predation, they wouldn't feel as comfortable, so you're removing that travel corridor from their per preferred habitat to your, to your crop field. So even on small property, um, you know, maintain an area that is not preferred habitat for rabbits in terms of habitat modification. In, in terms of rabbit population reduction as a management tool, remember that they are protected species. We have a hunting season for them. Uh, in an, an urban area, you can get a nuisance permit during the uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, on rural areas, a wildlife biologist would probably ask you about hunting. If you allow hunting during uh, the winter months, November, December, and through early January, um, if you don't, then he's probably going to encourage you to invite hunters onto your property to re help reduce the population. Actually, in Illinois, if you look at the entire population of rabbits, uh, eastern cottontail population is declining each year. Um, because of loss of habitat. So if you've had problems with rabbits in the past, then um, I, I suppose you would think that was good news. All right, white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer, um, you could look at the home range or the area in which that animal um, is finding its food, water, and shelter. So a doe is going to travel in about one square mile bucks. Uh, several square miles, and in most areas in Illinois, we're looking at linear type of habitat. So uh, that 640 to 3,000 acres is spread out along um, a water course, a river, um, drainage ditches, those kind of things. So uh, deer move in a surprisingly large area, and so it makes it a little bit of a challenge, but it's something to consider when you're developing some type a, a, an IPM plan for dealing with white-tailed deer on your property. And of course, not only just browsing the plants, but if you have an orchard, then damage from antler rubbing um, is something you need to consider. These are some slides showing the difference between um, antler rubbing on the bottom left-hand corner um, and that picture in the right hand where deer don't have teeth um, on top incisors in their mouth, so they have to grab and tear, and so that's the kind of damage you would see. And so if you're looking at some woody plants as an example, and you see clean cuts through the twig, then you would know that it's probably a, a rabbit or perhaps a groundhog, <clears throat> something that has front incisors, front teeth on the top and bottom of their jaws compared to deer would look more torn, uh, shredded as it was tearing off that woody part of the plant. Just a reminder, even though we're talking about vegetable production, that deer seem to be attracted to newly planted trees in your, in your landscape or on the farm. So if you go to the trouble of planting some, you're adding some um, fruit trees to your operation. Make sure that you fence the deer away from those or you're providing protection uh, beginning in September, September 1st, uh, from antler rubbing. Uh, in one night that a deer on a one inch tree, even a two inch tree, can remove all the bark on one side of that tree and uh, really make that tree in terms of its uh, productive potential uh, just about eliminated um, because it's not going to do well. They're probably going to have to replace that tree. So they can cause a lot of economic loss from antler rubbing. So um, make sure you use a commercial product. The, the um, picture shows uh, the use of wooden lath material, um, one inch wood strips um, with duct tape. And <clears throat> what I like about uh, this technique is that uh, in this area, uh, you see the arrow, there's open space. So with a, if you're going to use a commercial product uh, that entirely surrounds the tree, make sure it is tight to the ground. 
Otherwise, on thinned bark trees, voles can get inside that over the winter and still eat the bark and girdle that tree anyway. So um, we've used that. Um, that picture is from uh, the 4-H camp in Monticello, Illinois, um, and it's been pretty effective, real high population of deer. All right, so we want to keep deer out of your uh, crop field, um, keep them away from the, the sweet corn and strawberry tops, and uh, they seem to like cucumber leaves when, even though they're, they seem pretty spiny, you wouldn't think they're very palatable, but they'll eat those as well. Um, so we're going to fence those deer from the the area. Uh, there are lots of different fence designs, and in the resource, um, the Living with Wildlife in Illinois website, uh, which is, uh, you'll have that uh, at the end of the slide and under resources at that website, you can take a look at lots of different fence designs for deer. The type of fence you use um, kind of depends on the population of animals you've got. Um, remember that you don't, it's going to be more difficult to um, stop the deer from moving across your field if that's a if it's a natural travel corridor. So you're going to have to put something up that, you know, visually they can they can see very easy. Um, they're not going to go on through that, um, and they're uh, to guide them around your field. Uh, but a low population of deer, uh, as an example, this picture is just a one electric fence wire with aluminum foil tabs with peanut butter on the inside and so they smell that um, and get um, a, an electrical charge from that, elect that one strand of electric fence. You, you kind of think, well, why, you know, how does that work? Why don't they just jump over it? So deer are curious. Um, they also want to go under rather than over most barriers. So uh, the, the peanut butter tabs allow them to get that electrical charge, and it's a training tool. Any fence that you put up is essentially a training tool uh, to change the behavior of that deer. That, you know, it's not a great place to hang out and find food, um, you know, move them someplace else. Um, I've used um, two-strand electric wires to try to keep deer out and uh, just straight wires with some uh, white flagging and mylar flagging, and uh, when I did not have uh, those areas that I didn't have a big enough zone between the field buffer that they were brushy buffer they were coming out of, and they couldn't see that fence, then oftentimes they would hit that fence and go on through it, even though it was charged up. Uh, so it's really important that the deer can see that. Can use poly tape if you're going to use this kind of a temporary, and that's what it really probably is a temporary fence design. Uh, if you're trying to keep the deer, for example, out of a, a field of uh, sweet corn during that uh, pollination time. But low population of the deer, this is a fence that easy to put up, easy to take down. If your population of deer is higher than um, you, generally speaking, you're going to have to put up a fence that is more substantial. The picture at the top of the fence, top of the slide, shows a fence that um, is uh, relatively expensive. It's got multiple strands of wire going up to six to eight feet. Um, the recommendation on a fence that is not electrified, that built like the one at the top, is that you're um, recent recommendations are eight an eight foot barrier. So if you're at eight feet then with a straight vertical fence, um, that's enough to keep most of the deer out unless they're unless they're frightened of being chased by something and they may have seen deer go over an eight foot barrier. So um, an eight foot is the recommendation currently. Um, the the picture at the bottom is another type of electric fence and you see the maximum height on the outside wire where the deer would encounter that is 43 inches. So remember that idea that deer want to go through or under that obstacle. Um, so they try to step through that, they hit that bottom strand that's 15 inches off the ground and then they learn that that is not a safe 
way to travel through that. They also are kind of thrown off by this three strands of wire offset um, design. This is a design that they used at the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina uh, to keep deer out of those uh, garden areas. Um, and when I was down there a number of years ago, they said that deer um, that they, they, they would construct that fence and not electrify it the first night. And deer that can't encountered that fence when it was not charged up then continued to slip through that fence even though it was after it was electrified. So um, just if you're going to use an electric fence, the other thing that you need to remember is that you need to keep them electrified if you're going to put up a permanent electric fence because it is a training tool um, to keep the deer out. They, you know, they may need to be reminded from time to time. This is a fence design that is also in that publication on the Living with Wildlife website or on the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Control website that you have a reference of later. Um, and uh, but Mike Rogge uh, sent this over to me. I, I like that design uh, in terms of um, you know it's a good example of a barrier that you know it's only at six feet so. You would think that deer coming from the right of that slide towards the protected area are going to encounter that and jump on over or step, you know, they're going to want to step through that. So if you had problems with other animals like raccoons, that bottom strand of wire, if you put that at six inches and then add another one, so you can modify this fence even though it's, you know, maybe the primary design is for deer, you can add additional electric uh, an additional wire at the bottom if you're trying to keep raccoons out of the out of a garden space. But um, in this in this slide and the next slide, I kind of notice uh, that zone that area um, around the garden uh, is got good visibility, so the deer can see that obstacle coming toward uh, as they're walking towards that garden space. Um, they're not going to charge through that. Um, and um, and then removing the vegetation on the outside of that, maintain a, uh, a close mode area is also going to help provide um, you know, a little bit of habitat modification. Let's go to the next slide, and the this one uh, is a a new fence design. It's a, a mesh material that um, seems to be uh, pretty effective because it is to, you're setting up a barrier there, but it's hard for the deer to see it. So you need to add flagging where those arrows are to so that the deer can or mylar strips of mylar that are going to blow in the breeze to help train the deer that this fence is an obstacle for them now. Um, relatively expensive to install. Uh, looking at 10 foot, 8 to 10 foot, depending on the kind type of material you buy. Uh, available in both those both those widths, so um, fairly expensive to install, but it's a, a material that you may want to take a look at. Let's talk about taste repellents with deer for a minute. Um, again, the main thing, one of the key things to remember is uh, to read the label. Remember, we're talking about a product that's being regulated as a pesticide, so. You're going to notice on there you can't spray it to the, onto the vegetables. So active ingredients on taste repellents, and the goal of a taste repellent is to make that plant material um, taste bitter or it's not palatable. So putrefied whole egg solids are in a, the active ingredient in a lot of products like Gear Away, um, big game, big uh, big game uh, repellent, um, those types of trade names. Uh, Therem, that fungicide, is another active ingredient, and capsaicin, which is that active ingredient in peppers, um, is another active ingredient. And if you're going to, all these products, these taste repellents are great if you have some woody plant material, material you're trying to protect in the winter time, uh, to protect them from deer browsing, um, but not necessarily available for use on our vegetables. The only one that's labeled for use on vegetable and crop fields is ammonium soaps of fatty acids. You see that one listed secondly. This is the second group of, of 
repellents called area repellents or odor repellents. So it makes the area um, uh, not, um, it makes it smell bad. Um, and obviously with tankage putrefied meat scraps, which are application of that, you're putting some in a, um, a pop can size container or a pop can itself and setting those uh, or making a perimeter. So area repellents you're using around the perimeter of your garden uh, or crop field. And uh, an area, area repellent might be useful uh, in combination with a low cost of uh, electric fence uh, like that first one we looked at. So you're making it not only a, a barrier, a training barrier, they're hitting that electric fence, but also smells bad around the perimeter and so they're um, it, changing that behavior hopefully to move to another area. Um, <clears throat> now just remember that uh, there are a couple things that you know, you've heard maybe about human hair and bars of deodorant soap. There has been some research done with both those products and you'll find that information listed in the publication on white-tailed deer in the nuisance wildlife materials on, the, on both those websites. Um, but the area of protection is pretty small. Um, three feet apart for both the human hair and bars of soap. So probably ammonium soaps of fatty acid there or the trade name Hinder um, in vegetable production is a good uh, option for area repellents around the perimeter of your of your uh, crop field. Um, <clears throat> as I've already said, they're better suited for dormant trees and shrubs um, because another reason that those repellents are better suited for dormant trees is that you can think of a repellent as working like a contact <clears throat> pesticide. They're only <clears throat> making the plant taste bitter in those areas that uh, it's been applied to. So as the tree grows during the growing season, um, then you need to reapply that because the, the new shoot, new growth is not protected um, and so it's still palatable to the deer. Uh, repellents at the best are going to reduce the damage, not eliminate it. So you're going to need to use some other strategies uh, in, in conjunction with repellents, which would be part of a good integrated pest management approach. Population management for deer is, is another one that um, probably if you have a high population of deer, have a lot of problems, and you're not uh, making available recreational hunting or not hunting yourself, then <clears throat> that's something you should you, you may want to consider. Um, and reducing the number of does in the area um, is going to reduce the reproductive potential of the herd that are using probably part of your property. Remember they have a large home range. Um, the other thing that recreational hunting is going to going to do is again change the behavior of those deer. It's going to make them less comfortable on your property in the winter time and so they're going to move to adjacent areas. Um, and so it's probably most effective to reduce the damage in terms of changing their behavior in the winter time. Um, if you want to get a nuisance wildlife uh, removal permit. For deer it's a little bit different. They're called deer removal permits and you contact the Illinois Department of Natural Resources biologist. Um, uh, he or she would come out to your property and you're going to have to prove um, a percent of economic loss. So they would do an inspection and then um, apply that deer removal permit. Um, just remember that it is an only a, a temporary solution. You're going to have to add another component to that integrated approach. Habitat management or modification is one that's being looked at quite a bit in research today and um, some of the things they're looking at and suggesting, suggesting are you know leaving even a, a larger area, not just a visual buffer, but leaving open areas between the crop and wooded edges, if you have that kind of area on your property. Um, using a combination of both repellents and fencing near your field edge. Um, we kind of talked about that already. If you have wooded acreage, 
acreage on your property and you're not doing any kind of timber harvest um, or thinning that would create new areas of new growth on your forest, a lot of seedling or sapling sized trees, then that may be something to consider uh, that would provide that uh, tree and shrub for browse in the winter time, but also food plots. There's some research going on um, that uh, looking at, you know, do food plots attract more deer or do they provide an alternative food source? And if you think about the way repellents work, um, if there's an alternative food source available for deer, then they may are going to be more likely to move to that uh, away from that area that you've got uh, area or odor repellent. Probably have problems with voles. Voles are throughout Illinois. There's a little the the nose on a vole it looks like he's run into a wall, kind of a short stubby nose compared to a house mouse. Their tails are relatively short compared to their the size of their body, um, and <clears throat> bulls um, cause a variety of damage. You can see in the upper left hand slide their picture of a tree seedling where the bark has been chewed off, uh, damage to green beans, um, the habitat uh, on the right side of that slide, you see the runways that are created by clipping through that. They are a tall grass species animal. Um, so they do surface tunneling and also tunneling just below the surface of the ground. The picture in the bottom left hand corner is from heavy snow cover over a short grass turf area. So they were offered protection from predation and felt comfortable enough to expand their uh, feeding into that grassy area. The, two, the three species of voles that probably are most common um, that you may have problems with, prairie and meadow voles are, look very similar. Their tail is about twice as long as their back leg. Um, their, most of their runways are on the soil surface. They will go down underground um, from, uh, to den. Um, and then pine voles, their runways are usually just underneath the ground. And so you, in terms of tree damage, if you had some uh, orchard uh, seedlings you were trying to get established, then you would see damage actually on the roots uh, with pine voles. But probably your, <clears throat> in most cases, you probably have that prairie or meadow vole. You can use the same, you know, you, should I apply a, um, a rodenticide in this case or not, or do I have a problem with voles? You can say, use the same kind of monitoring that uh, with a little bit of modification. They use an orchard production and that's just referred to as the apple slice test or apple sign test. Um, and the recommendation is to put out uh, 30 monitoring stations per acre, uh, scatter those um, 30 to 40 feet apart and three rows, ten stations per row, and then you're putting a shingle, remember, you, or some kind of material uh, up, a um, piece of metal that's uh, attached down on the ground with a piece of apple under, underneath that shingle. You want to leave some space there because remember that prairie and meadow voles are feeding on the surface of the ground. So if it's tight to the ground, they may not, it may not be a true indication of whether you have many voles. You put that apple underneath there, check for uh, if it's gone or been chewed on 24 hours later. And then that uh, percentage of, da of apple slices with uh, that either have chew marks or gone or are missing would give you an estimate of whether you've got a you know, potential damage problem um, ahead or not, and whether you should go ahead and apply a rodenticide. And you can do this uh, in the spring and in the fall. Um, they had they reproduce year-round, but those populations can build up if we have a mild fall. Um, and then, so in the spring, you've got uh, a lot of bulls that are ready to continue to grow in their population. Um, and then you can use that test after you make an application of rodenticide. The rodenticides that are available for use, uh, two groups, the first one is zinc phosphide. It's a restricted use pesticide, so you need a commercial or private pesticide applicator license to purchase and use that product. 
is pelleted or there's a grain formulation. Uh, it's a one-time feeding. Um, so it, because it uh, kills those voles in a one-time feeding, it has, has also has high toxicity, toxicity to other wildlife. So um, you need to be very careful when you're using zinc phosphide. There are a couple of anticoagulant types of baits that are also av available. Chlorofacinone uh, is, is uh, effective to, for all voles and actually more effective or has high effectiveness for pine voles. Um, but anticoagulant baits, they require multiple feedings. So you're putting it in a bait station. Zinc phosphide generally applied, broadcast, can be broadcast applied if there's vegetation you're applying it to. Remember, you don't want to apply this, dump it on the ground in piles or in the bare areas because uh, you don't want to accidentally kill birds that might come along and eat that. Uh, zinc phosphide voles can also develop a bait shyness if you tried to use that year round. So it's a good product to use to knock down a large population and then you would follow that with chlorofacinone and bait stations uh, in the fall as an example to uh, prevent reinfestation in the spring. Make sure again you read and follow the pesticide labels on that rodenticide. Some of the non-chemical practices available for voles um, because they're a tall grass habitat animal Mowing those er mowing areas don't allow uh, areas of high grass to be adjacent to your uh, crop field, uh, your garden um, vegetable production area. Uh, maintain a, a buffer zone around that. Uh, predation is not thought to be a, a big um, limiting factor for wildlife, but uh, uh, if you're using it as an integrated approach, uh, putting up predator perches. Um, if you're going to use a winter, cut, winter cover crop, make sure that you follow that. Probably going to may or may not follow it with spring tillage, but really monitor the population of uh, that. You know, voles generally, when you've got some tillage, it's going to uh, keep voles out of an area. So you start making it more of a perennial type of environment, and <clears throat> it can be a problem. Uh, voles love sweet potatoes and they like the vines pr providing them some protection uh, from predation or being exposed to predation. So um, if you're uh, one of the practices that you may uh, try is using vertical supports to get the vines up off the ground uh, oops, to keep those voles out of, an, out of your sweet potatoes. They love sweet potatoes. Some other rodents that are kind of incidental, probably or may or may not be chipmunks. Are in, are in, if you uh, have a crop field adjacent to a forested area, then <clears throat> you may have problems with chipmunks uh, trying moving into your your crop field. Thirteen line ground squirrels are short grass habitat animals. We see those in. Uh, you may see them along mowed uh, ditches out in the, the country adjacent to uh, corn and soybean fields. The, there are rodenticides, zinc phosphide is labeled for use for both these animals. Uh, if you don't want to go that route, remember zinc phosphide has a high toxicity. 13 line ground squirrels uh, are very bait shy. You've got to pre-bait uh, those, um, some good recommendations in the fact sheet uh, on the web. Uh, about control of 13-line ground squirrel, squirrels using zinc phosphide rodenticide. Um, trapping, if, you're, if you've got just a small population you're dealing with, that um, trapping because it can be effective if you're persistent because they only have one litter of young per year, both chipmunks and 13-line ground squirrels. I wanted to mention groundhogs um, or woodchucks, <clears throat> whatever you want to call them. Uh, a little bit because they can cause quite a bit of damage because their home range is pretty small. So if groundhogs, um, all and generally speaking, um, mammals are going to disperse in the fall um, uh, from the new litter of young. So you may have a groundhog um, set up a den near your your production area. If it's in within that small home range, then um, probably are uh, looking at you know, one of three options, either trapping and removing that animal 
um, <clears throat> a gas cartridge um, is actually labeled for use with groundhogs. You would need a permit for that, um, a wildlife nuisance permit, because you're, it's a lethal control, um, or and or fencing would be the other option. And <clears throat> you take a look at this picture, uh, I'll kind of give you an idea of that just a straight woven wire fence is not enough for groundhogs. They're very good climbers, so you need to add a, an electric fence wire down at the bottom uh, as they're trying to get onto the fence, and then one at the top. And if you have problems with raccoons, um, this would, uh, that would also be a good design. Um, or, as I pointed out in that electric fence uh, that uh, from uh, Mike Rogi, Rogi uh, had sent me, if you add an additional uh, electric fence along the bottom for uh, a, a wire that's six inches, six to eight inches off the ground, and another one at 12 inches, and uh, will be a, a for most mammals going to be um, or most individuals it would be effective for keeping raccoons out of a, a sweet corn patch for uh, during that short period of time of uh, sweet corn production. When those ears are ripening, raccoons seem to want to get into that sweet corn about the time those ears are uh, just beginning to kernel set, not quite ready to pick, um, and raccoons are there to eat that. So. Um, Raccoon management is very similar to groundhogs. Both raccoons and groundhogs um, are protected species. So if you're going to uh, want to trap and move any of those animals, if you're going to use a live trap, you still need a permit. Uh, with raccoons, uh, because they are the number one carrier of rabies in the eastern United States, from about Ohio on east, um, they will not, your permit will not allow you to release that animal on um, someone else's property or on public property. It's got to be on your own property. Um, uh, otherwise, you have to euthanize that animal. If you get in, you know, speaking of euthanization of, of an animal you catch, if, when you get a permit, then you would also, you have to fill out a report and what you did with that animal, if you released it or euthanized it, and you would get instructions from the that are approved by the American Humane Society on euthanization. So, but again, your Illinois Department of Natural Resources wildlife biologist can help uh, explain the do's and don'ts with a nuisance permit. I wanted to mention birds just for a second. These three species are the ones that are not protected by state or federal laws. They're not native to the United States, the European starling, English sparrow or house sparrow, and uh, the pigeon. So, uh, you know, in some cases, these are also the three birds that you might have trying to get into buildings, um, yeah, handling, packing uh, buildings or inside uh, uh, machinery sheds um, and causing problems or concerns with their uh, uh, fecal material. So these are the ones that you can get a permit for to um, remove or you can hire someone to use an avicide um, and that product then is uh, used inside a building because other birds will not go inside that are native species. Um, so just keep in mind that those species are birds, all other birds are protected by not only Illinois law, but also state law. So be very careful when you're using rodenticides, especially zinc phosphide, but any rodenticide um, uh, to try to deal with voles. So you're not causing, accidentally causing death of birds um, from your application, because remember that it is a product that's regulated as a pesticide, it makes you liable for the use of um, that, um, that product, rodenticides are a type of pesticide. All right, and then uh, problems with birds generally uh, getting into, into fruit areas um, as that fruit ripens and bird netting can be pretty successful and if you, you just got to keep in mind that that netting has to be 
um, supported out away from, in this case, some grape, uh, a vineyard. Um, they're going to, again, be attracted to that fruit as it just begins to turn color. So if you procrastinate and wait till you start having, you notice a lot of birds in um, causing damage and on your uh, small fruits to do something about it, then you're probably going to have a little more difficulty getting those birds to move away from there. So they've learned that that's a great food source and they're going to be more persistent about uh, hanging out and causing damage. These are a couple of those resources I talked about. Each one of the animals that we talked about and, and, and many, many more we did not talk about today uh, have an individual fact sheet that uh, provides research-based information from the uh, extension system nationwide. We have regional extension specialists in the United States that deal with wildlife management, uh, both from a positive and a negative side, uh, that have contributed to this library of resources available uh, now on the internet. Uh, it's housed and managed by the University of Nebraska. Uh, so that's a great resource. I um, encourage you to, if you're looking for fence design, um, are repellents effective or not? You know, if, as an example with woodchucks and raccoons, there aren't any repellents that are labeled for use or that shown to be effective. Keep raccoons or, or um, groundhogs or voles for that matter. Uh, out of an area, so no repellents are uh, registered, but great resource. The University of Illinois Extension also has a website called Living with Wildlife in Illinois, and uh, again, great resources. It was a project that was put together in collaboration with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and has links to the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Control. If you're looking for your wildlife biologist to get a permit, then you can go to the Living with Wildlife in Illinois website um, and plug in your county and uh, uh, under the tab that says look in, find your wildlife biologist and find out who that person is to contact or to, even if you have a question about nuisance wildlife management. It also has a link there that um, in that same area that will allow you to um, search for uh, someone to hire a wildlife nuisance um, company that in your area. And so great, a great resource. I encourage you to check that out. Okay, before we uh, go into kind of a summary, uh, you know, reiterating some of these um, key points we've talked about today, I see uh, someone's asking about squirrels. We haven't talked about squirrels today. Uh, there are not any repellents uh, in terms of area repellents. So you might have, you know, in a, an area that uh, has a forested area adjacent to or near your crop field, uh, especially if you have a strong uh, fox squirrel. Those are the ones that look reddish, like a red fox color. Fox squirrels do a lot of ground feeding, and so are generally the culprits that go from a hedgerow or a woodlot into out into a field um, to eat vegetables. Uh, there, there aren't any area repellents that are going to be uh, effective to um, you know, keep them out of that area. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, you know, this last question I see about discouraging an empty barn, barn from attracting wildlife. You know, a lot of times if we have a storage area and we're concerned about um, our equipment for vegetable production our, uh, and uh, the fecal matter from bird roosting inside that building, there is a fact sheet on bird keeping birds out of, of buildings, and it there are products that similar to what they use. You might have seen one in a at a loading dock at a building that they're they're plastic curtains. Um, they use them in meat lockers and those kind of areas, um, and that, where you can still drive through that, uh, but it discourages the birds from getting into that. You know, you've got to tighten up barns. Uh, 
Sparrows can still squeeze through a hole. It's a little bit larger than an inch in diameter, an inch and an eighth, and they're in. Uh, so you got to make any opening less than an inch in diameter to keep sparrows out, house sparrows out, and that's going to keep the, any other any of the other two birds, uh, the starlings and pigeons, out as well. Okay, so kind of in our my first question here, I'd like you to um, uh, respond to. Repellents are one of the tools available for producers to use. And well, uh, Chris, you want to handle this part of it? Um, I'm going to respond to this question real quick here uh, about rodents in grain storage areas. Um, and there also is um, a really good publication. We don't have time to go into it, but there is one um, on at the Internet Internet Center for Wildlife Nuisance Management on mice and rats inside buildings. So um, if you would go to that, it's got some great um, uh, suggestions on, on management. Uh, and, and again, part of that is you know, closing up, tightening up areas, and then um, you know, probably going to need to use some type of rodenticide um, you know, plan because mice, a house mouse can squeeze through a hole. It's a little bit larger than a quarter inch in diameter, so pretty tough to tighten up those, you know, a lot of storage bins or storage areas. So the use of rodenticides and that publication, fact sheet on mice and rats, um, does a good job of explaining some some management techniques and and use of bait boxes. You know, if you're using a rodenticide and it's outside a building. You really need to use a bait box that keeps that away from not only wildlife but also uh, pets and children. Okay, I see Chris has um, indicated that uh, if you look at the chat box there, that to answer this these next uh, couple questions here, uh, A is going to respond to the question number one, B two. C3 and B4. So the first question, um, repellents are one of those tools available for producers to use in an integrated pest management approach to reduce crop damage from wildlife. So which statement is true? Number one, repellents are very effective to reduce damage. Two, repellents are an inexpensive IPM option. Number three, repellents are not regulated and can be used on any crop. And number four, repellents are regulated as a pesticide. You must follow label directions. And you can see that B uh, is the correct answer. They're regulated as a pesticide, and therefore you must follow those label directions. It is a legal document, just like any pesticide. Okay, let's go to the next question. Groundhogs are causing you economic loss on your on property you own. Therefore, you can remove the animal causing damage without a permit or license. So, number one, A. Number two, B. Great. So, you do need a license. Uh, exactly. Need a license. Even if you're going to just trap and move that animal, um, I always say jokingly to your neighbor's property, um, your permit will require you to, you know, to ask permission before you release that. And if you're going to release an animal, um, it'll tell you on this on your permit. But actually, you cannot release it on public property. So, um, which is what a lot of people want to do. You know, they don't want to kill the animal, so they just they take it out to the local park. They can't do that. All right, next question, which damage reduction technique is the most effective control for white-tailed deer? Is it A, population reduction, B, area repellents, C, electric fencing, or D, multiple strategies, integrated pest management? Great. So again, you know, IPM, even though it's a, a large animal, we're st it's still defined as a pest. Um, it's an important species in Illinois in terms of an economic um, viability for um, the state. 
but um, you know, if we travel back in time, back to 19 in the 1920s, they were uh, they were just uh, re reintroducing deer, white-tailed deer, to Illinois. So, um, you know, it's a it's an issue that um, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources continues to monitor. You know, what is our carrying capacity for white-tailed deer? But uh, on our own property, we just want to use an integrated approach. Um, if you can exclude them um, and and provide alternate food source um, or encourage them to stay out of your area with some area repellents it um, is, is going to hopefully um, keep the deer out of your out of your crop field all right and then who do I contact to obtain a nuisance wildlife permit or deer removal permit is it the University of Illinois Extension Office your local county animal control officer County Sheriff Department, Deputy, or the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife Biologist. All right, great. Again, you know, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources is the agency that has responsibility for managing our uh, natural resources, including wildlife in Illinois, so that's who you would contact. All right. Um, so again, you know, I just can't say it enough. Use an integrated approach when you're dealing with this animal that we've now defined it as defined as a pest. If you have additional questions or uh, need more information, I'd be glad to help you out. Um, you can drop me an email or give me a call. Um, I'd be happy to help it out. It, it, it is a wildlife nuisance management, like any kind of pest. Um, situation is a little bit different uh, for everyone and so just now think think through the process of what's going to work um, you know what animal have, have I got problems with and what's this habitat and what are my available strategies so glad to talk to you about that and um, if you have if there's anybody has any has some any questions be glad to okay the mouse fact sheet again if you go to one of these locations but the, if you just go to the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management um, I'm not sure we included it on our Living with Wildlife in Illinois website <clears throat> so go to this first website up here um, and that's where you can find that fact sheet um, moles so moles are another one that um, great information on both these two websites um, so I'd go encourage you to go to either one of the those websites. Um, moles trapping is actually the most effective control method. Uh, moles are insect eating animals, so um, there are some toxic baits that are available uh, on the market for moles. Um, but because they're an in insect eating animal. Uh, their effectiveness is um, not always consistent. So uh, the mole density per acre uh, through research is shown it to be four or six, up to six animals per acre. Um, you know, in the spring you might have once those young um, are moving out throughout the area. Um, you, it may be a little bit higher than that, but four to six animals. They only have one litter of young per year. So again, that's why low reproductive rate. If you're persistent about trapping, um, and go to the website and get the fact sheet on moles, and it'll tell you how to set those traps, how to determine the active run uh, in the in the area, um, and set the trap there. If you, most people give up too quickly with moles, you, but you should be able to catch a mole in one or two days. Uh, otherwise, you set that trap in the wrong place. So. But trapping is the recommendation. Okay, the question about rabbits. Um, lots of rabbits in in Mantino, um, and so um, yeah. So you need to discuss the uh, option if it's in an urban area. Um, you could release them. But you don't have to euthanize a rabbit. You could you permit probably would allow you to release that but it has to be on private property 
So you, know, you can't release the animal on public property like in a park, but you can release them in a, in a privately owned woodland. And that's primarily getting a permit if you live in an urban area. And this would be the time of year during their non-reproductive time that you would be more likely to get a permit. And they're not going to issue a permit when they have young. Um, just because of my comment earlier about, in general, our rabbit population in Illinois continues to decline because of habitat loss, with exception of those urban areas, great habitat. Um, but um, And it's, again, important game species. So. Well, again, uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, and uh, I'd be glad to answer questions in the future if you need it. Coyotes. What about coyotes? Um, uh, they are actually going to eat uh, vegetables from time to time. Coyotes um, are um, the, in that category of fur-bearing animals and that we have a trapping season and actually have a hunting season for coyotes, which uh, coyote hunting is available in those areas you can hunt. Um, year round with the exception of hunting during the shotgun deer season in Illinois. Um, very few people hunt or trap coyotes uh, like they did 30, 20 years ago. And so the population is, uh, can be locally very high. Um, uh, I've heard lots of different stories um, more lately about coyotes losing, you know, becoming um, very accustomed to humans. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, a human that in the, say, 30 years ago, humans that had a gun in their hand that were hunting coyotes, they learned that learned behavior. They learned to stay away from associate humans with danger. And so if the coyote encounters people and there's no negative repercussion, then it gets a little closer and closer. So I have heard of coyotes being fairly aggressive, um, which I never had heard of that before uh, just a couple years ago. So, um, and um, so that can be a problem in, in, in terms of managing, uh, managing those. It can be trapped and, and um, during the trapping season with a trapping license from Illinois or a hunting license, you can hunt them, except in urban areas. Uh, in urban areas, they become a little more problematic because of the cost of uh, trapping and moving those animals. So I encourage you to, if you, locally, if you have a problem with coyotes, to contact your wildlife biologist with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. But A, that person is aware of the problem, probably already knows about it, but may not, and can offer some suggestions on how to how to deal with that, or uh, perhaps involve um, some uh, professionals to deal with it. So, okay. Thank you very much, everyone.